So it's uh, really a treat and an honor uh, to be able, uh, able to be here on the occasion of uh, the appearance of Ann Nelson's second edition of her book, The Red Orchestra, uh, The Berlin Underground, and the Circle of Friends Who Resisted Hitler. Um, Anne uh, has, um, as you see, a stack of books uh, to her credit and uh, a career history that uh, I see as somehow picking up uh, themes that are subjects of, of the books. Uh, um, one of the uh, early moments in Anne's career was as a war correspondent in Central America, uh, where she got to uh, see some heroism in action. And I don't know, maybe could even be uh, called someone who was heroic in action. Uh, one of uh, her later uh, stops in her uh, career trajectory um, was as the, uh, the uh, head of the committee to protect uh, journalists, where her job was uh, in part to uh, publicize the, the dangers that journalists faced in um, difficult circumstances such as uh, war zones and those journalists certainly were were heroic and uh, and was uh, serving serving them at the time um, the red orchestra book is also about heroes so um, but also ordinary people who kind of rose to, to heroism. And so one of the things that, uh, you know, we might hear about is, you know, what, where that comes from. Uh, the, uh, another stop on uh, Anne's career trajectory was as uh, a literary writer. Uh, she's the author of The Guys, a play that uh, uh, was, about the firefighters of 9-11 that uh, was very successful on the stage in New York and uh, became a movie where Sigourney Weaver played the Ann Nelson uh, character. Uh, and you know, that was literary uh, writing. It was based on fact, uh, but uh, was, uh, was literary, at least in the sense that you like invented some dialogue that it was I mean, not uh, just uh, factual <laughs> uh, reporting. Um, and uh, so we're not surprised uh, that Red Orchestra, uh, even though it's a history book, um, was described as a literary and historical masterpiece um, uh, by uh, a German reviewer. And you know, this is a I think another theme of interest for us that unlike like most of the people who give talks at the Saltzman Institute, uh, they may be terrific in what they do, but not too many of them are literary in their qualities. And a particular interest is being literary, but also being a historically grounded social scientist at the same time. So uh, one of the, we're gonna listen carefully to sort of understand how to do this, even though we have like very little hope of, of achieving that literary success ourselves. Um, then uh, the other um, more contemporary part of Anne's career trajectory that is uh, also related to the theme of Red Orchestra it is uh, her book, uh, Shadow Networks, which is about the uh, far right uh, uh, organization that has uh, spawned um, uh, right-wing activism and uh, financed it for decades and uh, operating often in the shadows. 
And uh, one of the, the themes of uh, the new introduction that Anne has written to Red Orchestra is uh, the, the uh, phenomenon of resistance to the rise of authoritarian uh, illiberal movements and um, you know what what it takes to uh, recognize the problem and take action against this and it's you know, without uh, beating the drum too hard that her new introduction raises the question of parallels between the heroes in the Red Orchestra and uh, the contemporary uh, challenges for uh, citizenship, even in our own country and in our own times. So, uh, yeah, uh, please <laughs> Thank take you. it away. Thank you so much, Jack. Uh, you really have my appreciation, as does Ingrid Gertzman and Olivia Grinberg. Um, this Saltzman Institute is, is very dear to me and the community matters a lot to me. So I thank you and everybody for coming. Um, like Jack, the early part of my life uh, was very influenced by a love of the arts. Music and theater are things that I think, interests that we, and passions, I would say, that we share. And at <clears throat> the early part of my life, I thought that might be the, my professional path. Um, but there was also a nagging sense that I needed to be more engaged in uh, society, in the the world of politics and how the country was developing, how people were treated in my country. Um, and, and one way that I looked at that, being from a college town in Oklahoma, was the role of media systems. So I remember very clearly when we went from country music stations to national public radio, and there was this world of information and professional journalism that just opened up in, in our world. Um, and that led to a kind of lifelong fascination and looking at where these two issues converge. So one thing that you'll see in all of my books is the role of the artist. When you're facing a political crisis, does the artist sit to the side and say, I will make beautiful art that I hope people will appreciate and applaud? Or do they say, I have a role in this contemporary situation? Um, one thing that drew me to the Red Orchestra was the, the presence of so many people from the film industry, theater, uh, the fine arts, painting, classical music. These were people who said, we can't just stand by and watch the Nazis run the country even though we have no skill set in terms of political activity, we'll bring what we have. Um, and this moved me. They joined forces with academics, with journalists, with students, um, and, and formed this network. Now, we don't have a good term in English for the kind of network they form. The German is Querverbindung, which is just like a web of relationships where, you know, there were well over a hundred, maybe probably over 200 people who were active, but very few of them knew each other. They were interlocking circles of activity. And I would say that everybody in this room represents a category that was active and involved in the Red Orchestra. So I put together some slides just to give you a sense of the, them as people um, and, and what, what their path was. And a lot of them are just images that will not will not linger on. Um, but this is where I first came to the story. This is the ruins of the Gestapo headquarters where members of the Red Wings were detained and interrogated and in some cases tortured. And it had been an arts school. Um, and I had been, I, I was at the Columbia School of Journalism running the international program at the time. I was on a business trip to Germany. I came across this and I said, what is going on here? What is this about? And I found a picture of a woman named Greta Kukov and it said she was a member of a German resistance movement. She studied at the University of Wisconsin. And by the way, she was the first female president of a central bank in the world. This 
stimulated my interest. And I came back to the Columbia Library and started looking for them, and I could not find them. There were a few footnotes here and there, but there was really nothing about this movement, these individuals. So then I started looking at the, the anti-Nazi resistance groups in Germany um, after the Nazis took power. And maybe some of you saw Valkyrie, the Tom uh, Cruise movie about von Stauffenberg. White Rose has a musical on Broadway now. Um, but the Red Orchestra and the Harnack Schulze group had not really had attention in this country. So I undertook to write about it. People made fun of me. A friend of mine who was a vice president at the Wall Street Journal said, this will be the world's shortest book. It was not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, you know, what I also was looking at was where the Nazi movement came from and where the response originated. And so I had to go back in German history and, and look at some of the issues that gave rise to the radical right in Germany and the public reception for it. You had a country that had been really uh, quite exhilarated about World War I. Um, very, very much feeling that they were going to triumph on the front, and instead they were crushed. Um, the country was devastated with massive loss of life, as were the British and the French. But Germany was punished. They were held unilaterally responsible for the war, which was not, in fact, the case. There were many parties to starting the war. Germany was just one of them. And the, the French, in particular, really wanted to cripple the Germans and remove territory, required punitive reparations, <laughs> famine set in. Um, it was really desperate times. Uh, they gave up some of their most lucrative uh, properties and industries. And at the same time, you had this massive dislocation that was caused by the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So when these countries were formed after, after the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was broken up. You had masses of migration and you had masses of stateless individuals who didn't have a passport, didn't have a citizenship. And they started flooding other countries as migrants who were very, you know, very difficult to deal with. In the United States, there were so many of them in the 1920s that Congress passed a new restrictive uh, immigration law. In France, it caused a lot of social upheaval. It did in Germany as well. And at the same time, you had this, this devastation, both economically and socially, from the war and hyperinflation. I gave a talk about this book some years ago when a, a Jewish man came up to me afterwards and he said, I was in Germany as a child. My mother sent me to buy some shoes and the, and the store was closed and the price doubled overnight. So I couldn't buy the shoes. So you had people who just couldn't function under these conditions. So Weimar Germany, going into 1933, had a parliamentary democracy, but the multiplicity of parties caused some problems in terms of how the elections played out. The economic conditions were very difficult and hit very hard in rural areas and traditional German farmers who were fearful of losing their status and uh, their, their way of life. But you also had an incredibly vibrant arts environment and media and the most newspapers and the best news media really in the world at the time. So you had a lot of intellectual ferment and a lot of really capable people in the government trying to, to address the ills. So along about the late 20s, Greta went to the University of Wisconsin to study sociology. She met a brilliant economist there who was German, also an exchange student named Arvid Harnack and his American wife, Mildred. Um, they were really interested in American social movements. Uh, Greta went to uh, parties with African-American students and, and loved what she was seeing in the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the labor movement. Um, and brought these ideas back to Germany in 1929, but also faced the crash. So Germany, which was just getting back on its feet, was thrown back into economic chaos, red lines, massive unemployment. 
And this really fed the political extremes. Now, this was exacerbated by Stalin, who ordered or instructed the German communists, the KPD, to, to destabilize the government and the social democratic government and their centrist uh, allies. So even in this working class neighborhood, you've got the communists and the Nazis competing for working class support. The <clears throat> intelligentsia of Germany did not take Hitler and the Nazis seriously. They were regarded as lumpen who hung out in beer halls. They were not educated. They were thuggish. Um, but they were able to mobilize a certain amount of support in the public. And this was the kind of election propaganda that they produced. A workers await. Now here you have the Bolshevik and the Bolshevik and the Jewish financier and the Wall Street financier um, all uniting to oppose the blonde white German man, right? Who should be united against these forces of darkness. So in January and February of 1933, the Nazis manipulate the electoral system. Uh, they form a coalition with other right-wing parties and convince uh, them to name Hitler chancellor. You'll notice that the, the Nazis never won the majority of the German vote. And in fact, if you look at the elections going into 1932, they really peaked and then started to drop until March 33, when they took over a lot of the election mechanics. So they never, including the election that they uh, ran themselves, got the majority of the German support. They took advantage of the Reichstag fire set by parties who are still unknown today. And Hitler used this moment to declare a national emergency and suspend political process, so there weren't going to be any more elections because of the national emergency. He disabled his political and media opposition and seized power. So April 1933, he is holding the reins of power. He imprisons, uh, he, well, he sends his uh, political opposition and a lot of journalists to a camp, a holding camp, claiming that it's for their own protection to protect them from the anger of the people but they didn't see it that way. So this is interesting because you look at his concept of dissent. Uh, here is the opposition. They send him into a concentration camp. He gets a haircut. He's taught to march in a line. He gets his picture taken. And then at the Romanische Cafe where the Jewish intellectuals hang out, they say, what happened? We don't recognize him, right? So there's this whole idea that it's almost like a benevolent process where we're just teaching these people to clean up and, and, and follow orders. And this is the result. You get the new Germany, um, which is again, Aryan, uh, so-called Christian, although many Christians challenge that notion, but projecting unity and strength. The way they consolidated it was what they called Gleichschaltung, make everything conform. So that meant the arts, the press, you purge the police, you purge the professors, you purge the journalists, you make the armed forces wear an oath of loyalty to the Fuhrer. Um, and then you have that intellectual who has created a sculpture of dissent and contesting ideas, and Hitler smashes it and creates the new German, unified, strong, uh, a little homoerotic there. Um, University of Berlin, they burn books. They didn't just burn books. They required everybody to go through the school libraries and remove objectionable books. They went through home libraries and forced people to remove books that were not approved. And they had people who went in and checked the schools and the libraries and the homes for uh, banned books. They included Hemingway, Helen Keller, um, one of the members of the Red Orchestra, Günther Weisenborn, who had written, worked on theater with Bertolt Brecht. Um, yeah, there were just lots and lots of books that were not allowed. And then, of course, they tried to ban Jewish businesses and immediately had started to 
vilify Jews who were then less than 1% of the national population, but they implied that somehow they were responsible for all of the problems of the country, um, which was not just false, it was actually technically impossible. Um, now, people were very much uh, instructed to turn out for these parades. And this was the image that was projected to the rest of the world. And people said, well, there's no German opposition to Hitler because look at the parade. Um, so people have pointed out that if you're against Hitler, you don't show up in these parades and, and jeer at him because then you get arrested. There's no uh, public opinion polls. There's no way to know what the masses of people are really thinking. But if you just go by the newsreels with the police, with the parades, that's the impression you get both internally and, and outside the country. So one of the people who objected was an American, German-American journalist named John C. He was from Detroit. He wrote for the Rotten Fana, which was the, the communist newspaper, but he also wrote poetry based on wandering around New York and listening to saxophone players. Um, he was, the newspaper was shut down. He was, he lost a job. Um, Lots of the members of the Red Orchestra were affected very immediately and personally by what happened. And in a lot of cases, they had people who were close to them who were Jewish, who were fired or driven out of the country or otherwise persecuted. And they took it very personally. So they were not, well, with the exception of John C., they were not members of the Communist Party. Uh, none of the central characters were Jewish but pretty much all of them were close to people in one way or another who were Jewish and felt it deeply. So Arnott Arn Arn joined the Nazi party in order to infiltrate it. And he gave intelligence to the United States and all of the Soviets. His conduit to the United States was the economic attache at the, at the embassy, uh, Donald Heath, uh, but the US Embassy closed in 1939, and then he wasn't able to follow up on that. Uh, John Sieg led, led an anti-fascist communist group in Neukölln, and they made flyers. And he went to work for the, the state railway system, where he would misdirect trains of armaments through railroad signals and okay. organize people to smuggle information and flyers um, from Prague into Germany. Sometimes they took these flyers and these anti-Nazi publications and they would dismantle parts of the train and roll them up and stuff them into the, the train fittings. Um, but where is that city in New Where's It's part of Berlin. It's a working class section of Berlin. So they created anti-Nazi newspapers. I mean, newspaper is kind of a glorified term for what they were. Um, they were mimeographed flyers, and some people here are old enough to know what a mimeograph is, but they're produced, um, some of them were produced in this paint and wallpaper shed um, that was also in Neukölln, and used a, a mimeograph machine. Uh, this version was called a hectograph, and just for the youngins in the, in, the, in the room, you had a stencil, and then you typed on the stencil, and if you made a mistake, it was really uh, tedious to scrape it off with a razor blade, and then making multiple copies was not easy. Um, it was also complicated because the Nazis controlled how many pieces of paper you could buy and tracked people who bought paper envelopes and stamps and stencils. And only certain people could own a typewriter, which would not include any Jews. So just to produce 50 of these flyers was a real complicated operation. And if you were caught with an unauthorized hectograph, you were liable for arrest. So over the years leading into uh, World War II, there were various steps that a lot of Americans don't really uh, tune into. And you know, it, it, when I was growing up, a lot of people around me you know, considered World War II as starting December 7th, 1940 with Pearl Harbor. But the Europeans had a very different experience as the Nazis went into Austria, Czechoslovakia, and certainly Poland when, when Europe went to war. One thing that's interesting about their political messaging 
is the way that they convinced Germans that they were victims during the most aggressive periods of, of their actions. What they did was say, oh, here's, here's innocent little Germany and the French have these colonial black troops and all of these guns aimed at us. And oh, the Poles, uh, you know, uh, also are, and oh, look at look at Russia over there. So here we are. Uh, oh, and and Britain too. So everybody's surrounding Germany. And if you want to make people behave very badly, which they did, um, one way you do it is by appealing to their better instincts. So their message to Germans and German soldiers was. We're, you know, you're going to have to do some things that are really hard, but this is necessary to protect your family. Otherwise, you are going to be overrun and, and destroyed. And even when you look at um, Christopher Browning's brilliant book, uh, Ordinary Men, about a police battalion in Poland, you see very much that pattern, that these formerly decent policemen are set, sent to Poland and to conduct mass killings. And the only way they can go through with it is by getting drunk or high on drugs and being told over and over again that it's necessary to protect their families and their communities. So it's a form of indoctrination that deserves a lot more attention. The Greta Kukov and her husband met two central members. They became central to the Red Orchestra from the German elite. Harold Schulz of Voisin was from a very elite military family. His wife, Libertas, was the granddaughter of a prince. And she got a job as a publicist at Metro Goldwyn Mayer in Berlin after uh, Hitler had ordered all of the Jewish employees to be fired. And the business owners in Hollywood went along with it, which opened up all kinds of jobs for non Jewish Germans like Libertas. She was not politicized in the least until she married Carol Schultz of Poison. He was politicized because one of his student friends was Jewish and they published a newspaper together, a student paper. And when the Nazis uh, took stormtroopers, uh, captured them, dragged them down to a basement, beat them, and his friend died of the injuries. And he emerged uh, hospitalized with liver damage, but he said revenge is a dish best eaten cold. And he became a committed anti-Nazi from that period. Um, he had a very interesting personality. He was brilliant. He spoke, I don't know, seven or eight languages. Um, he was charismatic. People adored him. He was a little erratic. Uh, Kind of, and and with, I've spoken to members of his family, and he, you know, this is a very sedate military family, and they said he's the one that made the ladies rattle the teacups because he'd say outrageous things and then see the reaction. A lot of families have a character like that. So in late 1940, Harold Schulz of Poison found out Germany was going to invade the USSR. Arvid Harnack helped get the news to Moscow. Stalin blew them off didn't want to believe that Hitler was going to violate the agreement and did not prepare for the invasion that took place. There were disastrous consequences. Um, so Stalin, they were not, they did not regard Stalin favorably. They saw him as a kind of necessary counterweight to Hitler. If they were going to save Germany from Hitler, then they could only do it by helping Hitler's enemies. And they regarded this as patriotism, which is still a subject for discussion in Germany today. Do you support your country when the head of state is leading it to disaster, right? Uh, and I've had that conversation with German military officers. Um, so Germany invaded Russia and Stalin decided that he should pay attention to these people after all got them a radio, the radio signals were detected and the group was broken up. Now, they went down in history for many years as Soviet agents as a result of the messages they sent to, to the Soviet Union. And my book contests that 
um, because they started their work really in 1935 as anti-Nazi, uh, I mean, resistance is the word. Uh, they were publishing these flyers, they were recruiting people to oppose the Nazis in every way they could, and when and, and providing intelligence to the Americans as long as they could. Um, they only turned to the Soviets uh, in, in a concerted way when that was really the major avenue they saw to have an effect. And the Soviet agents that contacted them said, all right, no more helping your Jewish friends. They were helping smuggle people out and get money for them. Uh, no more flyers, no more recruiting people. And they said, sorry, um, we will not follow your instructions because we're resistance first and you're part of our efforts. We're not part of your efforts. And as somebody who studies media systems, I'm really interested in the Samizdat aspect of their work. Liberta Schulze Boysen got a job with Herbal's movie industry and worked in the documentary division. And she collected photographs and testimonies from soldiers returning from the front for propaganda films, some of which you can see on YouTube to this day. They're, you know, like uh, jolly little, you know, films of, you know, lovely German soldiers with the happy Polish maidens, um, you know, uh, for popular consumption. But she also got information from the soldiers that was darker and she managed to sweet talk them out of testimony of war crimes. So, they produced flyers based on these testimonies and would detail incidents from the Russian front in the massacre of civilians and complete with details, with dialogue, the whole thing, and would have texts like these, you know, write to soldiers in the field, uh, let the SS know people before them, right? This is very volatile stuff. And they put it in envelopes, they slipped it under doors, they put it in the backpacks of soldiers headed for the front. Another operation they had was with the Soviet Paradise exhibit that Goebbels organized in, in May 42 in front of the cathedral in Berlin. And Goebbels was trying to prove that uh, Jews were the Bolsheviks in Moscow, and therefore he was justifying the annihilation of both of them because they were going to annihilate Europe. So you see this, this conflagration of, of these ideas um, that was in this massive exhibit. And the Harold Schultz of Poison organized a little operation with the child's stamp stickers that, that had these stickers that were not very big. And it said, permanent exhibit, Nazi paradise, war, hunger, lies, Gestapo, how much longer? And he sent little groups of young people all over town to put up these stickers on phone booths and walls. And he actually took his service pistol and led the way. Um, and this operation was later depicted in a play that you'll be hearing about later. There was also a fascinating figure, uh, John Groudens, who was the New York Times bureau chief in the 1920s, and he helped with the writing and the copying of these. Another one of the students who went on these trips with plastering the, the stickers was a, a, a Jewish teenager named Liana Berkowitz. And these groups of students were the kind of people that, that went out on, on these little missions. Another one was Kato Benches van Beek, a ceramicist. She was very active in recruiting people and she had a workshop with her parents doing art ceramics, but then was indulged. And, and she recruited two of her friends who happened to be Jewish, but hid it from the Nazis and got scholarships to the State Art Academy. So uh, Katia Casella and Lisa Eglogiaudet um, were part of these groups as well. So this was all uh, really trying to break through the information blockade because you've got the, the Nazis controlling movies and journalism and books and everything else in society, even fashion magazines, right? They took over fashion magazines and tried to claim that the fashion designers in Frankfurt were better than Paris. I got some of them. Oh, that's fun. Um, but she got photos from the soldiers coming back from the front 
And I speculate that some of these photos found their way into the anti-Nazi flyers that they produced. This is a photograph that was taken by the German military of a massacre of Jews in what is now Ukraine. And this is from a flyer where it's almost, you know, it's, it's, it's etched, right, on a stencil because they couldn't reproduce the photographs. They didn't have the technology. But what they do is etch it. And it's, it's a very realistic depiction of something very similar to the previous image. And remember, soldiers at the Russian front were forbidden to talk about what they were doing. Right. So they were not allowed to talk to their family, anybody. So this was in June 1942, real time reporting breaking through massive censorship. So in the summer of 42, Schultze Poison tried to reach British intelligence in Switzerland, but <clears throat> he, he failed. He couldn't get out of the country and he was arrested shortly afterwards by the Gestapo. The Russians had sent his name and others and their addresses and their home phone numbers on the radio system to one of their agents. The code was broken and uh, the Red Orchestra was in, you know, effectively destroyed. Um, these are the Gestapo mugshots of Greta Kukov, Harold schultz Boysen, Arvid Harnock. Um, they were taken to the Gestapo headquarters and they arrested more than 150 people. They didn't get everyone. They executed over 55. We don't know exactly how many. And three members, including John C. from Detroit, killed themselves to avoid uh, naming names under torture. The prosecutor was Manfred Röder, who chose to pursue the death sentence in every possible case. Um, that included Leanna Berkowitz, 19 years old, pregnant, and uh, they let her live long enough to deliver the baby, and then they guillotined her for putting up stickers. Then the baby died in Nazi custody. There's the execution chamber. The men were hung from meat hooks. The women were guillotined by and large. Um, so what did they accomplish? The German resistance actually accomplished a fair amount. Uh, some of them, one of them went and persuaded Franco not to join the Axis powers. Uh, their intelligence ended up helping the Soviet allied effort. They gave Americans critical intelligence. They rescued as many Jews as they had, had the capability to do. But that capability was limited, but they did what they could at the risk of their lives. What happened after the war? Uh, well, people realized, in some cases, the scale of the German resistance. You have Three million Germans held in concentration camps for political reasons. That's a reasonable number. Tens of thousands executed and murdered there. And then almost 5,000 who were involved in the July 20th coup attempt alone. But despite what Spencer Tracy says in the movie, uh, the Nuremberg trials were a very limited effect of the 33,887 cases of war crimes, 3,400 cases were dropped without any prosecution. So they really, given the scale of war crimes, had a very limited effect. Uh, 103,000 individuals were charged, but only 6,400 were convicted. And almost all of them were out by 1951. And the United States recruited thousands of Nazis, including Klaus Barbie, for post-war intelligence work for the United States. So uh, yeah, the atonement was less than complete. Uh, Greta Kukov tried to get prosecution for uh, the people who had executed her husband and her friends. And the United States basically didn't care to pursue it. Um, she moved to East Germany and became president of the bank. 
but she was really too independent minded for the East Germans tastes, and she was purged from her position in 1958 and died in 1981. I was able to interview the last known survivor of the Red Orchestra, who was the Jewish art student, Katya Pasella. And she gave me some of the personal recollections that I have in the book. And it was really extraordinary to talk to her and see her spirit intact. So yeah, she became a, a, a prominent painter. She went and lived on an island in Spain. Um, and she really gave some of the last testimony that, that we had about what the daily life was like for these people. Now, I know the talk was, was titled, um, let's see, can I turn this off? Yeah, yeah on this side, there's an off. This little screen next to the computer. Ah. So, as I reflect on what we're going through in this country now, there are a lot of elements of this story that I find very haunting. And I'm just gonna walk through a few points. Um, let's see. So first, the base of the national social support came from non-urban areas that were expecting economic and social upheaval. You had a lot of issues around immigration where women and immigrants had taken over a lot of the, the, the males jobs during the war. And then the soldiers came back from the front and you had this upheaval in labor that was very destabilizing, especially to rural communities. And you also had following World War I and the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire on top of the pogroms of Jews in Russia and, and Poland. So you created this, this wave of immigration into German cities, as well as French and American, um, that was uh, suspect, that was held suspect, and people felt unsettled by the wave of immigration, people who didn't speak their language, people who may not look like them, people who may tilted the balance between what was considered a real German and a new German or a non-German. And so you had this tension between rural areas and traditional Germans and what they called the cosmopolitan, which was a code word for Jewish in many cases, urban areas uh, that was built up because of these historical reasons. Um, in, in the multi-party system of the Weimar period, the Social Democrats were fairly reasonable. They worked well with, they were center left. They worked with the centrists. And when they had a coalition with the communists, the government was relatively stable. When that coalition was broken up by what Stalin had instructed, as well as the minority parties, then you had a system where a minority of the electorate could have unusual weight in the system. So rather than a two-party system where one party wins the one that doesn't, you've got this fragmented situation that leads to horse trading, which helped Hitler reach power. Um, Hitler was generally underestimated by the German elite. He was regarded as uh, thuggish. He didn't express himself articulately. He had kind of a funny accent. Um, so... The conservative elite thought they could control them. The intellectuals didn't think he had the ability to take over. And the economic elite saw a way they could use him to make profits. Um, and that was only true to a point because ultimately his policies helped to destroy most of them. Another thing that interests me is that Hitler issued a blueprint before he took over. Mein Kampf was this long, fairly unreadable book but it really laid out what he planned to do. So in the same way that, that Project 2025, which just came out, is a thousand pages long, and you know, not many of us want to wade through it, it is like you know, a, a manual for what's planned. So uh, there's no need to be surprised what people do if they tell you in advance what that's going to be. Um, 
the Democratic parties and the institutions were weakened by political violence. So you had a lot of militia-like activities, you had disruption of election sites, you had both the extreme left and the extreme right, but you know, largely extreme right, but but also you know the 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 communists um, feeling that they could gain traction by disrupting the political process and undermining the government and and public institutions. And street fighting was a way to make people lose confidence in the government and their institutions. Hitler and his propaganda chief Joseph Goebbels created a new political model. They knew that they weren't gonna get the support of the elite newspapers. Uh, so they created these mass rally function and they would go out to areas that were not very well covered by the Berlin elite press and hold these big rallies. And if they were banned, they'd move them out of town and publicize that they'd been banned. So um, I'm very interested in the way that reawaken rallies are happening all over the country. Um, places like Tulsa, places like Phoenix, places where New York Times may or may not go. And they also made a point of being very innovative in campaign techniques by flying Hitler all over the country. That, that hadn't been done before. They had a big system for that. And they got a plane for Hitler during the campaign and really brought him to the people to use his personal presence and his weird charisma. Um, he utilized the moment of the emergency to capture power despite not winning the majority of the vote. That is very important for us to think about in the year that's coming along. After that happened, Goebbels consolidated media control in various ways. One of the most important ways was that he took the former uh, loose affiliation of radio stations, which were probably the most powerful medium in Germany at the time, but not particularly politicized. And he concentrated them under the Reichsradio so that everything was in one organization rather than uh, distributed by province or the Länder. And so one message going out from the central radio headquarters would reach all of Germany. And he went to the point of even making a mass produced cheap radio that could only be tuned to their station, right? And they called it the Goebbels Snout, right? Yeah. So controlling that information was incredibly important because that meant that whatever Hitler said could go unfiltered, unmediated by any gatekeepers, by any commentators. So it was almost effectively like a Twitter feed, uh, except on radio with live voice. And that kind of mastery of the media is is also in the playbook of, of many dictators. Um, so once you consolidate the control of the public schools, the universities, the fashion magazines, the movies, uh, people over time are surrounded by a single idea or a single philosophy and information uh, and then the rest of the information is blocked. So that kind of indoctrination over the first six years of the Nazi regime becomes almost complete. And it's very interesting that Harold Schultz of Boysen in the Air Force was assigned to read and translate foreign newspapers. So the fact that he and his friends had access to the British and the American and the French press gave them the ability to see over the wall of propaganda, and they were driven to share information with their fellow Germans. And that's why these, you know, almost pathetic little measures of 50 mimeographs and the stickers on the phone booth, you know, they were just driven to risk their lives to, to get this information out in these very uh, primitive ways. Something else that, and finally, um, Something that I think about a lot is how from 1933 to 1935, there was a somewhat functioning legal system. So you have cases where human rights lawyers uh, and others could represent people who were falsely accused, whether it was political opponents, Jews or anyone else, 
and get a court ruling that was honest. Uh, but gradually, over time, the judges were replaced by ideologues. And it took a little while to replace them at every level of the court system, but it happened. And the same thing happened with the attorneys. So once you have full control of the courts, you determine the law. And in the case of the Red Orchestra, uh, Hitler was able to determine the outcome of every trial. Uh, so, so Mildred Harnack, the, the American woman, was sentenced to prison and the sentence was sent to Hitler for his approval and he overturned it personally, individually, unilaterally and said, no, she must be executed. And the judge says, okay, uh, so she was. So the court capture, the defeat of an information system and its replacement by a parallel information system, which is driven and controlled by propaganda, the control of education and other fountains of knowledge. Um, all of these things did not happen overnight. And that's, I think, the important lesson for us to learn about our time because we have an erosion of our public institutions and our democratic institutions and our architecture of knowledge in universities and journalism and publishing that have come under attack. And I think that what we can learn from the Red Orchestra is that even people who have dedicated their lives to things like music and painting and theater and the study of economics, um, you know, have something to bring if they have a sense of conviction and the determination to defend what is best in their society. Thanks. Uh, a lot to chew on. <laughs> the, the floor is now open for anybody to ask questions or make comments. Yeah, in the back. Uh, hello there. Thank you so much for showing the experience and your insights. Uh, my name is Pini Um So I was kind of wondering, uh, I mean, uh, I'm sure you must have uh, seen what's going on currently in the world, uh, especially, in, for instance, in South Asia. Uh, have you come across uh, some similarities that you have just mentioned just now? Uh, could you please elaborate if you have any insights on that as well? Uh, maybe I can also sort of verify because I come from South Asia. Yeah, well, I mean, I I look at this playbook, which is not restricted to Germany. Um, in a lot of the elements that I talk about in terms of control of the press and the schools and so on, you can you can see reflected in Modi's policies in India and the idea of the suppression of religious minorities, um, as well as Orban and Hungary and other places. I mean, it, it, I suppose it's almost, you know, like a, like maybe not a science, but, but it's re replicated in so many movements that seek to establish authoritarian control. So I'm not an expert on Southeast Asia, but I think every part of the world has experienced some form of this. Right. If you allow me, I can also share some some of my perspectives. You're the oh well. Uh, let's see if people uh, have other questions, and we'll, we'll we'll give people more than one bite on the cookie. But yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. Really enjoyed it. And um, on. I'm interested as well in the post-war reception of the Red Orchestra in the Federal Republic. One of the most, I mean, to me, as a historian, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating kind of post one of the by story as well. The way these stories, individuals have been grown and looked for a long time in, in the Federal Republic, Republic itself. And the way anti nazi resistance in general was taken in the 1950s in particular. Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting question. The Cold War dynamics, the way they fit in with the with the way this has been, this, these stories have been um, recycled and, you know, all over and over. Yes. Yeah, um, so what happened was that <clears throat> about a third of the known members of the Red Orchestra were Communist Party members. And that's recorded. Um, that gave the Western, the United States and West Germany 
pause, even though it wasn't the majority. And at that point, the East Germans, and especially Eric Milka and his Soviet friends, uh, decided to appropriate them. So Milka established a secret archive and uh, gathered all of the documentation that he could from the surviving members, kept it under lock and key, and then filtered out uh, highly, highly censored versions of the history. And so these were really uh, not available to scholars until the Venda, when the wall came down. And even then it took a while for people to even understand where the archives were and how to access them. Um, so in the meantime, the Americans and the West Germans decided that they would go with the 20th of July movement as their banner, because the military anti-Nazis were safe and not particularly political. Even though if you look at von Stauffenberg, he had, you know, in some cases, some Soviet sympathies, it is said. So I was very lucky <laughs> in some ways. I had finished the draft of the book got into the Gedenkstadt of the Widerstand's archives, and one of the people who was the expert said, oh, you might want to look at this. It was the manuscript of Greta Kukov's book that was annotated by the East German censor. And I had an hour before I had to leave for the airport, so I was <laughs> you know, taking notes in a crazed fashion. But I kept finding these passages where she'd say, the Nazis wanted to destroy the Jews and the gypsies, and, and he'd cross it out and say, you can't say that. This was a this was a class war, not a race war, right? And that's what came out in the book uh, because she had no way to respond. So uh, as you probably know, the East Germans tried to erase the evidence that Jews were a persecuted class. Uh, it was just if they were proletariat, then they had problems. But not, and so um, the effect has been to really suppress this history. And gradually in, I would say the early 2000s, more of this started coming out in Germany. And my book was part of this process the the review in Der Spiegel was very interesting because they said it took an American writer to publish this book because she doesn't have a dog in this fight, right? Yeah, you know, people like in Germany, people say, "What was your grandfather doing?" And you know, I say, "My grandfather was growing soybeans in Nebraska. You can't blame him." Mm -hmm. um, so now you have streets and schools named after members of the Red Orchestra and a kind of coming together and also a greater recognition of the humanitarian efforts, which is really important to me. Question from the Q&A, because we have a Zoom audience oh. as well. Um, it's, do you think the Nazis would have prevailed if there was truly unadulterated free speech in Germany? And what do you think the lessons about freedom of expression give us today? Well, I, I think that um, when they prevailed in 1933, uh, there was effectively free speech in Germany. It was just all of the economic and social and political upheaval that created the opportunity for them. So I, I would love to think that free speech were, was, were a magic answer, but I think that on its own combined with misinformation and, and toxic propaganda, uh, reason and speech doesn't always prevail. Uh, and that doesn't, and I think what we need to think a lot more about that because we have so much, we, we have the floodgates of information opened to us now with a lot of the digital media and in the same way that Hitler's unfiltered speech was damaging to the Germans, we have a lot of information that's that's coming at people in this country that is is damaging to the public, and we don't we don't know what to do about it. 
Um, but I think that we should we should systematically address it rather than just sitting back and watch watch it happen. Well, I'm more new. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I come from Indonesia and I re relate a lot of, a lot of things that you said. Um, I have a question. Um, do you have any signals or signs of the time as to when or if a red orchestra can come to life? Because in my experience after 2019, the student political movement gets weaker and weaker. So students were targeted uh, with their academic life. So they are threatened not to graduate and things like that. So it's really sad. And in my country, many political parties come from the same one party, mm -hmm. the Golkar party. And even Joshua Oppenheimer, who made a movie about this, it was for Oscar nominated. He was confused as to why this party uh, didn't go away uh, the same way that Nazi uh, disappeared. Uh, so do you have like any signs of the time? I feel like uh, in my country, the academics, students, um, even artists are now like lethargic maybe. Some even uh, cross the other way to like they uh, make, uh, they appear in the political campaigns of these um, oligarchs. Um, and it's really sad. But is there any signs of the time of him, um, like young generation try to initiate this new um, generation of, you know, persistence because it's really obvious. Yeah, one thing that struck me in doing this research was that he had, had Hitler been a little less ambitious, he would have won. It was an historical accident that he was defeated. Once he took over Western Europe and had Britain embattled and alone, he had an opportunity to just consolidate his victory. And it was only going into the Soviet Union, which was ex overextending himself through hubris, that stopped him, from what I can see. I don't, I don't think that the United States was going to get into the battle. I don't think Britain could have held out forever. So what you had was Hitler defeating himself in many ways. Mm -hmm. Now, in truly consolidated authoritarian regimes, like the Soviet Union, they have a lot more staying power. So they lasted for decades and decades, unlike the 12 year reign of, of the Nazis. And I think that it's very, it's, it's, it's very difficult and I, I sympathize with you, but I think you're doing what you can do, which is to keep your mind alive. And you can do that by traveling and studying in other countries. You can do that by creating small groups of discussions, which is something that the Red Orchestra did. And to keep your thinking from being taken over, from not allowing yourself to be normalized by something that's not normal, right? and waiting because often sooner or later, the authoritarians get overconfident and overextend themselves and create an opportunity. You know, um, and, and you have to have people who are ready to seize the moment when it, when it occurs. Um, so it's, it's just a matter of preparation and waiting and building alliances inside and outside the country and, and trying to hold on to your own human values of, of decency and integrity. It mortifies me for how um, the Nazis hold so much hatred and anger against just a small portion of the community, the, Jew, the Jewish people back then. What were the underlying causes for this? Were there any um, like class discrepancies between the most of the Germany and the Jewish were here in the race, land, properties. What was the what was what what was the reason that people why what like why? Why they had so much hatred? Well, I can think of several reasons. One was jealousy. Um, I would say that the Jewish population in Berlin held a disproportionate number of educational degrees 
had a, a culture of education and people in the professions and achieved a lot in that area. And a lot of people without the education didn't understand why. Um, but if they didn't have a culture of education in the professions, then it was a bigger leap for them. But I see it also as pure opportunism because by, by uh, vilifying the Jews and driving them out, they were able to take their property and and make massive profits and extending it all over Europe. Um, it was it was it was a massive case of, of robbery. Um, and also it was political opportunism because people won't I was reading something about analyzing the US political situation this morning. And it was talking about, they, they interviewed a Trump voter. I was like, why did you vote for Trump? And he said, because he hugged the flag. And it had nothing to do with any policies, any ideas. It was this symbolism and this emotion. And one of the most powerful emotions is hatred. So if you get people to disregard everything else that's that's operational in their lives and say that you know, the Jews are responsible, then uh, it, it, it inspires the emotions that, that drive the movement. And right now, what I see as a parallel is a, a case of the right driving hatred of LGBTQ people, especially trans people. And did you know that no American high school girl will ever win a track meet because of those terrible trans people, right? That's that's the kind of information that's being put out there in these populations. And I looked it up. There are only 32 cases of trans people competing in college level sports in America, 32, right? But this is this massive propaganda operation as though, you know, it's the worst thing that ever happened. And again, trans people are far less than 1% of the American population, but they're being blown up as, as this threat to society. And there are two, there, there's another aspect that's, that's common because if you go to rural areas and less populated areas, such as the, the Germans uh, in, the, in the 20s and the Americans now, most of the rural Germans had never met a Jew, and a lot of the rural Americans have never seen a trans person. So if you say, oh, they're the hidden force, that they're pulling all the strings, you know, and, and if you saw one, you'd recognize them because they look like the devil, you know. Um, it's preying on, on ignorance and, and unfamiliarity. So, uh, Dirk, do you have any, any comments to add on that question? In terms of the motivation that they might have had? Are you asking me? No, no, I'm asking my colleague here who knows a lot about the subject. Please. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking you, you definitely need to uh, create a community by finding someone outside whom everyone can share a common enemy. And uh, it can be the devil in religion. But uh, the Jew has always been a wonderful uh, focal point for dissent in Europe because the Jewish tradition is not nationalist, or if it is nationalist, it might be Zionist, but it definitely always creates an internal community which says we live here, but we're not part of it. And this makes the Jewish communities very vulnerable, but also wonderful as an example of these outsiders who do not share our values, who prey on us, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but, but what struck me in your presentation was the emphasis on the role of the media and how important it is. In my country, in the Netherlands, many young people joined the SS because of the propaganda uh, describing the threat of the Russians going to overwhelm us. And, um, it would nearly seem that autocracies uh, prey on weak democracies to pounce. They hover over you, and the moment your own system becomes uh, fragile, your own democracy goes to a tough bit, 
like Germany in 1929, when Weimar was really tested, that's the moment you pass. And it, it makes me really wonder about this country, whether the democracy I see here is so fragile that it's possible to pounce in it at the moment and destroy it. And lots of what you described was so ominous it does its parallels. Yeah, yeah and, and Dirk has a really interesting point there because pogroms were not just Germany and Eastern Europe. You had them in England in certain periods of history. You had, and in fact, in the 1920s, Germany was, Berlin was one of the most hospitable cities in Europe for Jews. And Jews were holding high <clears throat> government offices. They were in very prominent places in the arts and culture. So um, it, the, the discrimination was actually worse in England and France at the time than it was in Germany. Uh, but I do feel that this massive destabilization in Germany allowed an opening for a lot of these old forces to come out of the closet. Mm -hmm. So I, I uh, my apologize because I, I did miss most of your talk. And I also haven't finished the book, even though I'm very excited to, but this discussion reminds me of um, uh, a portion where uh, uh, Joe Kennedy Sr. sends Joe Jr. to kind of snip out what's happening in Germany. And he says, exactly to your point, that Hitler saw the need to make somebody the goat. And, you know, too bad it turned out to be the Jews, but it wasn't necessarily unfounded and whatever. Um, so I'm curious to to hear about um, you know there's other kind of play, side characters in this story who kind of become main characters in the kind of grand uh, geopolitics with George Keenan who I think was posted in mm -hmm. Um You quote or you cite a book from Alan Dulles I think about the German underground which is extremely interesting in terms of analyzing intelligence failure and resistance. Um, so I'm curious what lessons they took from this period of you know the mid early 30s to the mid 40s and afterwards and how that got reshaped by the Cold War and different priorities. Yeah, you know, one thing that really shocked me was how fast the United States pivoted. And, you know, spoiler alert, <laughs> I, I have a later quote from William Shirer, who had, you know, is talking to a Nazi uh, who's, who quotes a, at a West Point graduate military officer who tells the Nazis, well, you you kind of had it right about the Jews, you know. Um, and many people have read Shira's Berlin Diary. An even more interesting book is the After Berlin Diary, where he's talking about the post-war period and how quickly American intelligence and foreign policy pivoted to the anti-communist line, which I, I think is understandable and in some ways defensible. But the problem is that people who were of the German left, like Greta Kukov and others, were caught in the vines. She was not a Stalinist. She was, you know, she was probably a socialist who in and and Gunther Weisenborn and and others from the group Adolf Brimmer became prominent in West Germany. There was not really political division within them, but but they just got trapped in that space to the detriment of, of everybody and then vilified in the West and, you know, uh, appropriated by the East. And one thing that happened in the course of that, that harks back to what Jack was saying about my time in Central America, is that we, we kind of lost the ability to make these distinctions. And when I was in El Salvador writing about the massacres of Christian Democrats and labor leaders and so on, the Reagan administration responds is, well, they're all communists. And I, well, no, I'm, I'm a kind of a stickler on these things. Some are communists, some are not. Some are Lutheran, some are, you know, let's, let's try to have a little precision about this stuff. And I think that the anti-communist current in the United States made that impossible for 50 years. Um, there's a, I mean, Stalin was a monster. He was profoundly anti-democratic in every possible way. Uh, but many of the people of the German left were not at all 
that courage and they were mislabeled as it. So it was a lot of lost opportunities there. And I think that to some extent that kind of goes on and, and maybe, you know, Jack and some of his other esteemed political scientists can help us come up with new nomenclature that goes beyond left and right and finds ways to label authoritarian governments that have the same practice regardless of what they call themselves. When you have Putin and Orban emerging in various ways, we need new names for these things. You, don't you think? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, well, there's certainly a, a lot of, you know, discussion of various ways to describe these uh, strongman populist uh, regimes, uh, which, um, you know, can, can be kind of all over the place in terms of their ideology, although recently they've been drifting in it in a particular direction. So we're we're working on it. Good. We, 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 I'm sure we political scientists will come up with more jargon than you could possibly choke down well, in this way. Two, two aspects of this that really <clears throat> bother me. And one is for the last how many years, few years, a lot of people who are progressives talk about the resistance, the resistance. And I'm like, hey, it's the resistance. And I'm like, hey, guys, there's an electoral process that has functioned. These people did not go into anything like a resistance until it was impossible to hold an election. So get out and do the work, you know, do the canvassing, do the phone banking, do whatever. You have the freedom to do that now. And if you do it and you're defeated and we live under a dictatorship, You'll need a resistance, <laughs> but that's not now. That's that's kind of dishonoring these people. Um, and the other is the way they throw around the term fascist. And it is not, I don't see it as a precise term to apply to our current situation. It, it's not a fascist effort. And I struggle, you know, my shadow network talks about the radical right. Um, that's as close as I've been able to come at the moment. Because for all of the attention to Christian nationalism, if you remove the economic interests and the fossil fuels, you miss half the story. And it's very easy to you know, point the finger at evangelicals in the Midwest, but they don't have the capacity or the will to do this on their own. And again, that's the same, You know, if, if Hitler had not had the industrialists behind him, he couldn't have financed his movement. So you, you know, the old journalism school, the mantra, follow the money. So uh, I want to ask about your books as literary narratives. Since in this room, there are people who write books or will be writing books or even read books. And all of them it's, great. And um, and part of my framing of the question is uh, a, a visitor who gave a, a talk about human rights, and um, she has been uh, frustrated about attempts to do you know, legal and institutional changes that strengthen rights for women uh, around the world, but that somehow so much of the oppressive system remains that even if you get some improvements in rights for women, uh, somehow the outcomes are only for some women. Or And so in this kind of situation of frustration, she and some of her colleagues have been turning to the arts as a way to make more um, dramatic and maybe revolutionary impact kinds of uh, statements about that to to not just change people's you know uh, uh, theory of change for some NGO but to uh, create a cultural wave through the arts and so you know literary narratives are you know, Uncle Tom's Cabin is like the, the classic example. And so just thinking about uh, uh, how you've been doing it 
And, you know, the guys, the Red Orchestra, Suzanne's Children, Shadow Networks, although less Shadow Network, uh, uh, these are literary uh, narratives. Um, but they're, they're working kind of differently. And um, let me kind of prime you a little bit and then ask you how you think about choices in making these literary. Uh, so your book about the guys, the firefighters after 9-11 was um, post-apocalyptic um, in, in, in the way that it felt in kind of the art scene at the time. The global war on terror, the, the world was going to hell in a, a handbasket. Little did they know <laughs> how bad it would get. Uh, and uh, so there, there was that theme in the arts of the day. But um, and arguably, the guys was like part of that, but not part of it, because it was really a literary uh, effort that was about a group of people and their character. It wasn't about the World Trade Center as a global political uh, crisis, you know, or, or was it? Um, Red Orchestra, uh, a group biography in the social and political uh, setting, Suz Suzanne's children, uh, uh, an individual biography that had, I think, sort of a more conventional almost plot line because you were following the one heroic figure. Um, all three of those guys, Red Orchestra and Suzanne, are about heroes of different kinds. Shadow Network, uh, more straight history with political commentary, but strong characters, but not heroes. The, all your characters were anti-heroes. So, I mean, do you, how do you see how do you see what you're doing when you're like constructing these literary works? Um, how do you choose across these like, styles of putting together the, the work, uh, or is it more just? If it feels right, that's what you're going to put on the page. Well, okay. So one answer is I try not to write the kind of book I don't want to read. And I like to read books that have rich characters who are making difficult decisions. Um, and and to, I try to live their experience along with them in sequence. Um, so, so all of those pieces of writing have that in common. And I've never said this before, but I think I have to say it. Uh, a lot of what I'm writing about grows out of my experience of 1970s feminism. And, you know, as, as a high school student in Oklahoma, I think I felt that women were considered powerless and voiceless. And to push back against that and assert values, you know, um, and I you know, try to assert humane values. You know, no, you, you, just, you can't just hurt people and have it go unnoticed and undocumented. No, that's, you know, we may not be able to stop you, but we can record what you've done and push back. Um, and also, you know, the, the time in El Salvador, how much I yearned to stop the war and the killing, and all I could do was document it. And then I, you know, ended up working for Human Rights Watch and the Committee to Protect Journalists. And the documentation was a function, and it was better to have it done than not to have it done. Um, so that, you know, in in lieu of having power, at least providing voice. Um, because you know, part of me would just really yearn to be a pure artist, you know, in whatever form. Um, and I, there's a documentary based on Shadow Network that just premiered in Palm Springs, um, where I'm starting to feel like the documentary work is almost, <laughs> I, when I say performance art, I, I don't mean it in the traditional way, but it is a form of performance. 
And the PBS series, Rise of the Nazis, interviewed me about the Red Orchestra and its, its storytelling. And it's also this form of trying to bring people to life and make them real rather than footnotes, right? Um, because because that's what I respond to. And and it's it's kind of a lovely thing to write a book because you have so much control, right? Making a movie, there are a million different cooks in the room and the writer is perhaps the least important. But writing a book, you pretty much get to have your say. And unless you really screw it up, they'll publish it. <laughs> Um, so it's, it, it feels like a fairly <clears throat> pure form of expression. Lousy way to make a living. But but there is a certain satisfaction in just kind of seeing a body of work after uh, some years that, that subscribe to the same values, even if they take different forms. The, uh... I, I'm just curious because we have a theater professional in the room who's familiar with the guys as well as, do you have any comment on this broader question? I, yeah, I, I've been, I, the, the thought that was coming into my mind about two questions ago that I think relates to what you're saying. My name is David Skies, I'm an actor and a, and a, a professor of theater over at, over at Barnard and, um, and a producer. And, I've been thinking about how um, when you were talking about language and fascism and progressive and all of that and the need for new the need for new words, and I was thinking about okay, liberal and illiberal is sort of coming out there, but but the problem one of the biggest problems I think is that language that the other side and I'm going to assume there is something we can identify as another side in this room that they make they they are so good at rendering language. Um, powerless they take everything that we try to do whether it is expanding our notion of gender whether it is critical race theory whether it is historicizing our historicizing our injustices in a way that provide context so that we hopefully understand them better and they turn them they turn it all into word salad um such that we are we can't do anything but i think that the arts, like poetry, uh, visual arts, theater, of course, dance, music, it's never just about words. Poetry is poetry, not because of the words on the page, but because of the spaces between the words on the page. And because it is using words to point at something that words cannot by themselves capture. And so even if they take away all of our words, they can't take away the human response to watching a narrative and investing in characters and watching people stand up against dominant oppressive systems and the courage that that takes. You can destroy the word courage, but you cannot destroy the psycho-emotional response that we have in witness of it. So I think in that sense, there is something about my experience of reading your books and of, and of reading the work of the kinds of people that you write about or experiencing the work or listening to or watching the work of the kinds of people that you're writing about, which is uh, as a human being, I'm getting the message and I'm not getting the message. There was just a, this incredible piece of music called Chernobyldorf at La Mama that was, um, it's a piece of quote, post-apocalyptic choral new music opera where it's like people in a destroyed world trying to find trying to recapture ritual from artifacts of the of our now destroyed civilization, right? And the words are, the words themselves are incomprehensible, but the meaning of it was one of those profound things I've experienced in yeah. And so I think, I don't know, that's what- But I, and it's, it's also another way of keeping the thoughts and the thinking process alive and, and not falling into uh, their attempt to model our thinking and to get us to be less decent human beings, right? I mean, that's 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 what, what the Nazis did. They took people who were not bad people and they made them do terrible things and made them believe in doing terrible things. And the way I see it is that the fact that these people in the Red Orchestra were you know, the artists 
are charged with looking at the world in a pure way and and not according to ideological frameworks. It's, you know, if they think the sky is gray today, that's what they paint. That's what, you know, they write. Um, whereas everybody else, you know, who were following the Nazis would say it was whatever color Hitler said it was yesterday. Um, David, do you want to talk about uh, the illegals? Yeah, sure. So as when Anne was, I mean, correct me if I get the sequence wrong, when Anne was researching the Red Orchestra, one of the characters that she mentioned a couple of times was a playwright named Tim Vivendorn, um, who, as she said, had been a collaborator with Brecht, co wrote the mother with him. Um, but when a lot of people fled the country, Vivendorn stayed and became a part of the Red Orchestra, a part of the resistance. And then, um, like, basically in, 19, in 1946, right after the war, Ended, he wrote a play called The Illegal and the Illegals, um, which was a kind of dramatic version, uh, a, a, a dramatic first hand account of some of their resistance activities. And it became a huge hit in East Germany at the time and was a big, and, and many, many, many productions over the years. But it, um, and West Germany. And West Germany, mm -hmm. but it's never been done outside, as far as we know, outside of Germany. And it, I don't think it's still particularly done there. But Anne, so in, in encountering Weisenborn and working on this book, Anne discovered this play and translated it into English, um, where and that translation has never been heard, has never been done anywhere. The play has never been heard or seen or done in, in the Anglophone world. And um, uh, I, I got, I was connected to Anne 12 years ago by a friend, by one of Anne's former students here at SIPA, who was also one of my theater colleagues um, about doing an internal reading of it. And we did years ago do a, a kind of table read of the play and then sort of let it sit. But we, um, last year in my own class in Barnard, I worked on the, I brought the illegals back. I worked on the play with my students. Anne came in, was an amazing presence. And we, uh, and the, just the dramatic power of the play really, came back um, in force um, in relation to the history we're all living. So we've been looking for an opp opportunities to get it back up. And we have one, which is that on Friday, February, uh, Sunday, February 11th at 7 p.m., we're going to be doing a public, the first ever public reading of the illegals in English at a theater in Midtown called uh, Theater 555. It's on 42nd Street, right off to Right off the river, we have an incredible group of actors, some Broadway veterans, a lot of down, little downtown theater characters, um, and uh, a couple of, and some very young students, some current students as well, reflecting the diversity of the actual membership of the Red Orchestra. Um, so that's on the, the 11th, I'm directing it. Uh, we will we will be there, and um, it's, it's for free. free. <laughs> so please take a take a look at the flyer that's going around, and um, and if you're curious, come come join us. You heard it first here. We did. Yes. Yeah, you definitely want to uh, take Anne's advice about what theater to go to. She's. Uh, the one who uh, tipped me off uh, to Hamilton even before anybody else had heard of it. So thanks for that. So just to uh, stick on the literary aspects for a minute, uh, the um, human rights uh, scholar that I was referring to who was frustrated and wanted the arts, her normal way of uh, uh, you know, doing her scholarship is precisely what you were talking about, to, to uh, reconstruct the perspectives of you know, grassroots people, um, especially the victims of human rights abuse and like, what's happening to them, how they're experiencing it, uh, what are their wants and hopes. And, um, but um, she also talks to uh, people who are in ambivalent situations, uh, like corrupt policemen who don't get paid and therefore, you know, need to feed their families. And what does it feel uh, to be in, in that bind? Um, and 
So first question, does it feel different when you're writing about the shadow network uh, masterminds of malfeasance as opposed to when you're talking uh, writing about your uh, resistance heroes? And also um, the mode of research. So for the guys, you were doing essentially interviews, live interviews, although there, there, there had been a purpose uh, uh, to help them write their eulogies, but what it turned into was you know source material interviews of live people, as opposed to reconstructing characters from the historical record. So, um, so if, if you have thoughts about like how it feels to be doing um, sympathetic and unsympathetic subjects and how you feel about live interviews versus historical reconstruction of personalities as a way to do this thing that you do. Well, um, I, I haven't been, um, I, I spent a lot of time in college acting and singing in theater. And one thing that I learned as, and I, I'm not a, a, a highly experienced accomplished playwright, I've learned some things. And one of them is that in a play, every character thinks they're the hero, right? Including the bad guys. You know, the bad guys never go onto stage thinking, I am evil, I'm going to, you know. It, so, you know, for me, that 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 map of Germany with everybody pointing guns, you know, that is really important because that provides a motivation, right? So that people didn't just wake up one morning and say, oh, I used to be good, but now I'm evil. That's not how human psychology works. And so when I write about the people in in anything, including uh, the the right wing fundamentalists working on, you know, fossil fuel money, I try to look for what motivates them that seems to them to be good. Now, I, I, I have to say my imagination fails with the Koch brothers <laughs> because all I can find with them is greed. I, I can't see them, you know, with a, a higher mission than that. Um, so, you know, sorry. But, but with the fundamentalists, you know, especially having grown up among so many of them in Oklahoma, I, I really do struggle to get inside their head. And I do see something about when you've had a society that you think is the norm, and maybe it's a somewhat isolated society, right? You're not getting a lot of cosmopolitan outside influences. And it's the fantasy that America had of you know, the church in the town square and, and the high school football team and, and really very much what I grew up with and people desperately fearing they're losing that. And if you tell them they're losing it to Mexican drug lords and, you know, to all of these scary, you know, Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, riots, um, they do have this urge to defend and protect. And it's really tragic when, when that's militarized by, by lies and mm -hmm. false threats. Um, and that's why I focus so much on information systems, right? If, if they're not getting factual information, then they're more susceptible to these new, these, these fabricated media systems that feed them only the information that will propel them into ill-advised political activity. And I unwillingly have continued to speak about shadow network and to try to reach out and have dialogues with people ranging from pastors in North Carolina to you know movie audiences in California to try to urge people to defend our democracy and the things that are worthwhile in our society, because I see these forces as being incredibly dangerous. And they have really laid out what they intend to do. And, and what they intend to do is to persecute LGBT people in ever 
more cruel and senseless ways and remove women's rights that were hard won over the last century and uh, increase racial and economic disparities and all kinds of things where I, I, I just can't quietly go along with it. Um, so I, I don't at all wish to be an activist, but I do want to defend my values and my home and my family and my fellow citizens and my friends who are not deserving of attack. Um, so, so I guess that's why I identify with people like the Red Orchestra and like Suzanne Spock and Suzanne's children. Um, you know, and what they have in common is you've got to do something. If you just sit back and watch and wring your hands and criticize them, you're at best a passive bystander and at worst complicit. Um, and so when I do my podcast and everything else, I say nobody can do everything, but everyone can do something. And this is the year to do it. Um, so I guess I see writing as a way that I can use my creative impulses to carry forward the values that I, I profoundly believe in. But also it feels like understanding the radical right, you know, understanding these German farmers in Bavaria who feel threatened because there are Jewish doctors in the city. You know, it's like what, what motivates them and how do you get them past that, right? How do you reach them? What platforms can you communicate with them on? How do you ward off the, the, the values that will limit the public education for them and that will limit the books on their bookshelves and, and trap them in these media silos that they experience, and by extension, my German relatives in Nebraska experience? Yeah, but the small cities and towns in uh, Germany and Weimar were in media, media uh, silos. The uh, head of the board of directors of Krupp Steel uh, owned the wire services that had a monopoly on news going to German small cities and towns in the 1920s. And he fed them a steady diet of uh, ultra-nationalist propaganda. Uh, oh, he was also the head of the largest nationalist political party in, in Weimar. Uh, but he did not prosper because he came crashing down with the Great Depression and it was Hitler who benefited from all that nationalist propaganda that uh, the crook people had been promoting. But I also think it's really important for people and in institutions like universities to get out of our ivory towers. Mm -hmm. We are very good at critiquing society. We are less good at engaging with it. Mm -hmm. And engaging with it means listening and not assuming that we've got all the answers and they don't. And I, I see over my you know, 40 to 50 year career, that's that's become quite exaggerated. You know, the, the function of the critique as opposed to the engagement. And that has come along with contempt for certain classes in our society. You don't hear many kind words for you know, farmers and, and, and blue collar people and people who have their own concept of their own struggles, which to which they're entitled. Um, so I think I think we also need to also get out of our East Coast urban environment and reconnect with the rest of the country the same way that the Berlin elite newspaper editors had no idea what was going on in rural Bavaria to their immense dismay. Well, I think we have to depart because there's a group of students that are in here <laughs> practicing their listening in eight minutes. So. I've got a couple of copies of the book if anybody's interested, and then some postcards about the other book. So thank you so much. <laughs>